Hello, comrades, and welcome to the podcast you are currently listening to. I promise, this isn't a Russian invasion, just a temporary occupation. I'm Roberto, one of the hosts of the podcast, Czar Power. And I'm Brendan, the other half of the podcast. Together, we're ranking the Russian rulers from Rurik to Putin. They will compete based on how well they fought, how successful they were in life, how much kompromat, or blackmail, they had on them, how handsome they were, and how long they ruled for. After being scored, we decide whether they get to party it out in the Kremlin or get sent straight to the Gulag. Those who make it to the Kremlin will need to duke it out for the position of best Russian ruler. You can find us on any podcast host as Tsar Power, on Twitter at Tsar Power Pod, and on Facebook as Tsar Power. That's Tsar spelled T-S-A-R. Now, back to your regularly scheduled podcast. And if you hear a knock on your door, beware. The KGB is coming to make your stay a bit more permanent. Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the West, Episode 9, The Ghent War. Today we are going to see Philip the Bold come to power both in Flanders and in France. The death of Charles V in 1380 gave Philip a spot on the Regency Council along with his brothers, and the death of Louis of Mala in 1384 meant that Philip inherited, through his wife of course, the counties of Flanders, Artois, Burgundy, Nevers, and Rethel, and the lordships of Antwerp and Mechelen. However, while Artois, the Franche Comte, and the others were simply passed along to Philip, the situation in Flanders was complicated by the fact that Ghent had been in open revolt. By the end of the episode, Philip will be Duke of Burgundy, Count of Burgundy Palatine, Count of Flanders, Count of Artois, Count of Nevers, Count of Rethel, and Lord of Antwerp and Mechelen, so I believe it's worth noting how he got there. Most of the work had been done by Louis of Mala and his ancestors, the Dampierre Counts of Flanders, and their dynastic marriages. Philip would continue this trend, and shortly after inheriting Flanders, planted the seeds for the eventual unification of the Low Countries, but in 1380, what he brought to the table, more so than casks of Burgundian wine from the Bonne region, was mastery of France. Philip's dominant position on the Regency Council meant that he could draw on the resources of the crown to further his own dynastic aims. He did so to deal with the upstart city of Ghent, and he did so to line his pockets. In the mid-1380s, Philip would draw about the same amount of money from the central government as he was able to raise in taxes and aids from all of his southern territories, the two Burgundies and Nevers. The resources and wealth that Philip controlled via the regency did much to enhance his prestige and power, and thus it came to pass that Philip spent more time in Paris than he did in Burgundy or Flanders. We shouldn't consider him an absentee ruler for this. Paris was equidistant from Flanders and Burgundy, and the routes coming to and from Paris tended to be in much better condition than those crossing France otherwise. Staying in Paris allowed Philip to keep one eye on Burgundy, one eye on Flanders, and his hands on the royal government. On his deathbed, Charles V had the chance to reflect on his legacy and the state that he left his kingdom in. He was satisfied with how the war had gone under his direction, most of Aquitaine had been taken back, and France found new fortresses and castles popping up to help defend her against future English assaults. In fact, the most famous, or infamous, French fortress, the Bastille, was constructed during this push of castleization. However, while the war had been largely successful under Charles V, the French economy had been quite strained by this effort. Specifically, the crown had imposed a new hearth tax that hit the people of France quite hard. So as he was dying, Charles V called on his son to give some relief to the people. Also thinking of the future and the fate of his 11-year-old son, Charles made his oldest brother Louis of Anjou regent. Philip and his other brother, John the Duke of Berry, were charged to be guardians of the new king, 
but they were not content in that position. There's even a story from Charles VI's coronation where Philip pushed his brother Louis out of the seat next to the king and took his place, claiming that as first peer of the realm, Louis was in his spot. This certainly was a good way to see how the struggles between the princes to pull the new king's strings would go. The three brothers clashed repeatedly in the months after the death of Charles V, but in the end they agreed to share the regency. Louis of Anjou, by virtue of his seniority and previous position as sole regent, was given presidency of the regency council. Philip, however, would not have to stand behind his brother for long. In 1382, Louis was presented with an opportunity to claim the crown of Naples for himself, so he promptly quit the country for southern Italy, leaving Philip and John in charge of the kingdom. The two brothers split France between themselves. Philip took control over the north, while John ran the south, but this was mostly for the ease of administration. The division was not some Carolingian-style split, and the two brothers still ran a united kingdom. In these years, whenever things came to a head, John deferred to Philip. While John may have been the older of the two, Philip was superior to his brother in political skill and energy. Really, I think the biggest reason that Philip ended up as the power behind the throne, while his brothers and Charles V's old politickers didn't, was simply because he wanted it the most. That is not to say that there weren't other interested parties. The old ministers of Charles V did make their voices heard, and there were a handful of powerful generals and lords that did not need to appeal for the Duke of Burgundy's patronage. The two most important of these men were the Duke of Bourbon, the maternal uncle of Charles VI, and Olivier de Clisson, the new constable of France. The Regency Council was made up of powerful men, and while the preeminent member, Philip was unable to unilaterally run things. As Jonathan Sumption wrote, quote, the Duke of Burgundy's decisions were always constrained by a weight of consensus, which represented a strong break on personal government. So while Philip did not have complete control over the crown, he was still by far the most influential party. His control of the king really only began to get challenged once Charles VI's brother Louis of Orléans grew up. Philip would find Louis of Orléans to be a near equal when it comes to wheeling and dealing, and died before a definitive showdown occurred. It'll be up to his son John to want it the most then, and we'll see how that plays out. So once Philip had firm control of the central government, the first thing he needed to do was raise taxes again. After all, he had a war to pay for and a treasury to plunder. In Philip's defense, he was not the only one making this decision, and was not the only one of his brothers plundering the treasury. Louis of Anjou was still in Paris when the decision to reinstate the taxes called off on Charles V's deathbed was made, but he did leave the government to Philip to deal with the aftermath. When the people heard that the much-hated hearth taxes were making a return, there were riots. Rouen in Normandy was the first place to feel the popular backlash, and Philip, along with the young king, began the trek down the Seine to deal with it. However, they would not make it to Normandy, or even out of the Ile de France, and the Norman officials would end up having to deal with that revolt themselves, because shortly after they left for Rouen, Paris itself was consumed by violence. Philip and Charles thus made it back to Paris as quickly as possible, but not before the people of Paris stormed the Hotel de Ville, armed themselves with maillet, large lead hammers, and killed all the tax collectors they could find. And as this kind of violence often combines economic rage with anti-Semitic rage, the Jews of Paris were next on the rioters' list. The Mayaton revolt thus became a vicious pogrom in addition to a tax riot, as was the unfortunate lot of medieval European Jews. The next few days were filled with rage and desperation-fueled rioting. Echoing the riots of Etienne Marcel, the people of Paris once again chanted, Ghent! Ghent! and it seems by this point that Ghent was fully associated with anti-noble sentiment. It was even rumored that the uprisings in Paris and Rouen were encouraged by Ghent agents. When the chaotic violence began to die down, the guild leaders took control of the situation and presented the duke and the king with a list of demands. Charles, but really Philip, agreed to some, but not all of the demands, but the guildsmen were not willing to back down and so the royal forces settled into a siege of Paris. 
Philip was then joined by his brother John, and the two, along with their nephew, finally brought order back to Paris. There wasn't a grand offensive march into the city, but negotiation was able to pacify some of the Parisians, while limited but effective shows of force pacified the rest. In the end, the leaders of the revolt feared the mob they led as much as they feared the forces of the Duke of Burgundy, and so became willing to facilitate a compromise. Paris was not the only city in revolt. The early 1380s saw unrest flare up throughout England and France. England's most famous convulsion was the Peasants' Revolt, also known as Watt Tyler's Rebellion. France had uprisings in Rouen and Paris, but this period also saw many cities, especially throughout the south, rise up in revolt. Even outside of France and England, the plague and general economic downturn had sparked many other revolts. Italy, Bohemia, and Germany all saw similar uprisings in this period. In an interesting turn of events, as Philip the Bold had secured some exemptions from royal taxes in Burgundy when he was granted the duchy, Burgundy was not really hit by this wave of uprisings. And so Philip got to beat the snot out of a bunch of peasants and townsfolk without worrying that his own peasants would get any funny ideas. Despite being resolved, these uprisings caused enough trouble that they forced the royal government to backtrack a bit on the issue of taxation. But Philip was a patient man, and knew that if he moved slowly, he could eventually reinstitute the needed taxes. So over the next few years, the taxes returned bit by bit, but it was marginal enough of a change so that no more great uprisings were triggered. And so now, Philip really only had one uprising left to deal with, the Ghent War. When we last left Ghent and Louis of Mala in December 1379, Philip had negotiated a short-lived peace between the Count and the three members of Flanders. When the truce broke down, Louis appealed to Paris for help. While Philip was keen to help, Louis of Mala was broadly disliked by the rest of the Regency Council, and in 1380 the Council was still dominated by Louis of Anjou. Louis of Mala's neutrality in the Hundred Years' War combined with his friendship with the ever-in-revolt Duke of Brittany and his support of the Roman Pope to alienate the other council members. So despite Philip's urging, he was sent away without anything to show. Despite receiving no aid from the French court, this next round of fighting started off fairly well for the Count. The break in the fighting did give the other two members, Bruges and Ypres, some time to think, and they realized that the rebellion really only served to help Ghent. The more radical factions, mostly members of the Weavers' Guilds, were unseated from their places in the Bruges and Ypres government, and replaced with others who, while they may not have been allies of Louis, were not hostile to him. Therefore, shortly after violence re-erupted, Louis managed to pacify the other two members. By the end of summer 1380, Ghent was standing alone against the Count. Louis attempted to put Ghent under siege, but as the city was so large, it was impossible for him to completely surround it. Things never came to a head, and a temporary truce was agreed to. During this next round of peace, Louis further extended his control over Bruges and Ypres. In all honesty, if you ignore Ghent itself, Louis's control over Flanders was as strong as it had ever been. The truce saw him stripping even more power from the Bruges and Ypres municipal governments and ensuring men loyal, or at least amenable to him, were in control of the cities. But unfortunately for all involved, Ghent was impossible to ignore, and so yet again, the truce ended without a deal being reached, and Louis attempted another siege of Ghent. This time, he was able to invest the city completely, with the help of a Burgundian contingent sent by his son-in-law. Ghent was beginning to starve, and two factions began to form. The moderate faction was led by the butchers and the shippers, and wanted to finally make peace with the count. However, they would be outmaneuvered by the radical faction, led by the weavers and the youngest son of the brewer of Ghent, Philip von Artevelde. Philip's rise to power in Ghent was made easier by the fact that the moderate faction had attempted to negotiate with the count, but Louis's terms were deemed too punitive and ended up discrediting them. In late 1381, Artevelde and the radical faction seized control of Ghent. Philip von Artevelde was not a bit less ruthless than his father was and began his rule by settling old scores. He tracked down the men he felt responsible for his father's death and had them all killed, 
If any of them were already dead, he would instead kill their oldest male relative. Once he was finished with his revenge, von Artevelde set about strengthening his hold over Ghent. He selected a handful of aldermen of the city that he saw as threats or insufficiently loyal to him, and had them killed as well. All of this was in keeping with the legacy of his father. I didn't get as much into this previously, but Jakob von Artevelde was known as a ruthless and vicious leader. He was followed at all times by a heavily armed guard, and with a subtle hand signal, could sick them on anyone he wanted gotten rid of. Once again, following in his father's footsteps, Philip von Artevelde renewed an English alliance. In fact, Philip had been receiving a stipend from the English crown since the 1360s in hopes that he would be able to take control of Flanders as his father had done. But unfortunately for Ghent and Philip, the English were too busy with their own peasant war and the war with France to give aid to the Gentinars. While Ghent was in the midst of regime change, Louis of Mala once again gave up his siege and moved his headquarters to Bruges. The Gentinars knew that another siege was likely to come soon, and by now had exhausted much of their stores. Therefore, they decided to go on the offensive, and hopefully remove Louis's ability to blockade their city. The Ghent forces, led by the White Hoods, a quasi-independent militia with connections to the Weavers' Guild, ended up being much more successful than they had thought they'd be. Louis had just been reinforced in Bruges, and that's where the Ghent forces decided to strike. Despite being outnumbered, the Gentinars launched a surprise attack on Bruges. The Ghent militia found Bruges in the midst of a festival, and the forces that assembled to fight them off were undisciplined, unprepared, and in many cases, inebriated. The Bruges forces quickly evaporated, and the Gentinars made their way into Bruges. Louis saw his forces and his fortunes disappear. He then pulled the age-old move of a general who is desperate to get out of Dodge. He disguised himself as a peasant and ran for dear life. Eventually, Louis made his way out, swimming across the moat of Bruges, the same moat that his father had once filled in after Philip VI stepped in to end a revolt in Flanders. Continuing the theme of not-so-subtle imagery, after taking Bruges, the White Hoods then marched on the castle of Mala, which was right outside the city, sacked it, and literally destroyed the crib that Louis slept in as a baby. The news of Ghent's conquest of Bruges had lit a fire under the more radical cloth workers throughout Flanders. The weavers of Ypres and Courtrai both threw out officials loyal to Louis and submitted to Philip von Artevelde. Once again, Louis had to flee, and revolutionary forces were spreading throughout the county. Louis reached Lille, which for now was out of the reach of the radical Flemings. In another ironic twist of fate, upon reaching Lille, he learned that his mother had died, and so the same day that he lost Flanders, he gained Artois and the county of Burgundy. Once more, Louis was forced to ask for help. Luckily for him, his son-in-law and heir was now running the French government, and had just put down a number of other revolts that were quite literally cheering on Ghent. Still, though, there was a significant corps of advisors who were not inclined to assist Louis of Mala. Philip the Bold needed no motivation to act on behalf of the Count, and it seemed that, in the end, Charles VI did not take much convincing. Of course, he was very much still being led around by his uncles, but there were legitimate reasons, reasons not directly tied to Philip's inheritance, that is, for royal intervention into Flanders. The most obvious of which was the ominous chanting of Ghent, Ghent, or Long Live Ghent, that he must have heard during the Mayotan and related uprisings. Not only that, the Ghent forces had begun raiding into French territory. Philip von Artevelde was also currently courting the English for aid, and the French had no intention of handing Flanders back to their rivals across the sea. In a more ideological framework, it's been argued that the revolutionary government of von Artevelde posed a threat to the current order of society, all across Flanders, townspeople were burning down rural manors owned by the nobility. There is also something to be said of Charles VI himself. He was 14 at the time and had been raised in court. He had little real-life experience and had spent his whole life surrounded by counselors and underlings. He never experienced the frustration and friction that some time as an adult dauphin under a king might have given him, and so he never really learned to deal with adversity.
He had no understanding of the lives and conditions of the common person and what might cause them to rebel. He only knew that he was king, the top of the hierarchy, and that those at the bottom did not know their place. Not to mention, as a 14-year-old boy, he was utterly obsessed with the imagery of war and the chivalric ideal. The French response was also motivated by a religious element. Last episode, I mentioned the Papal Schism, and while the French supported the Avignon Papacy, most of the Flemish supported the Roman Papacy. Clement VII, the Pope in Avignon, excommunicated the Flemish rebels, and the French preparations for the campaign seemed as much like a crusade as a civil conflict. As much as Philip the Bold's interest pushed him to intervene in Flanders, he was not above being compensated for his efforts. He received about 100,000 francs from both Louis of Mala and from the French crown. He also used this opportunity to request an aid from the Duchy of Burgundy, quote, for the king's war. Sure, Philip. Still, though, the south of France was in turmoil. John of Berry had lost much of his authority to the Count of Foix, and there was a constant threat of an English chevouché from Bordeaux. The attention of the French court was thus focused on Languedoc rather than Flanders. In the end, it was the rapidity that Louis of Mala's situation deteriorated that swung French attention back north. As the French were deciding between an expedition to Languedoc and one to Flanders, the English were deciding between one to Flanders and one into Portugal. The English ultimately decided against aiding the Flemings when Artevelde's terms of alliance proved too haughty. He apparently thought himself to be in a much stronger position than he was, and requested a large sum of money that the king allegedly owed Ghent from the time of his father's alliance for the privilege of sending an army to help. Once the Flemish diplomats left their meeting with the English court, the English counselors burst out laughing over the terms. Eventually, more reasonable negotiations began to occur, but no real progress was made. By the time that the Flemish diplomats left England to receive further instructions, they found their path back to Flanders blocked by the French army. Arras, one of the leading cities in Louis of Mala's newly inherited county of Artois, would be the staging area for the French forces. Nobles brought soldiers from all over France. Due to the nobles' fear and loathing of the urban uprisings and the other town's tacit or actual support of them, the army assembled was almost entirely drawn from knights, with as few town militias summoned as possible. The largest single contingent, about a fifth of the total forces, came from Burgundy. All told, the royal forces ended up around 10,000 in size, mainly knights. Philip von Artevelde, meanwhile, was summoning an army of his own by Audenarde, a town he was currently besieging. He, conversely, relied almost exclusively on urban militias. Von Artevelde was able to raise about 30,000 infantry. The Flemings had a huge numerical advantage, but their forces did not have nearly the same amount of training or discipline as the French had. The forces first made contact in late November 1382. Flanders, at the time, was cold and rainy, and Philip von Artevelde's initial strategy was to wait out and weaken the French forces. However, with the French on the move and von Artevelde's confidence unshakable, the Flemings decided to offer battle. The two forces ended up meeting not far from Courtrai by the little hamlet of Rosebeek, modern Vestrosebeke. Upon approaching each other, the French unfurled the Oriflamme, the battle standard of the King of France. I mentioned the Oriflamme when I talked about Poitiers, but I didn't mention its religious significance. It was supposed to be only used in holy war, and its use here was justified by the people of Flanders' refusal to submit to the Pope in Avignon. Not sure how John justified it in Poitiers, though. Maybe that's why the battle was so disastrous. But the Battle of Rusbeck initially looked a lot more like the Battle of the Golden Spurs than the Battle of Poitiers, although that's not a good sign either. The battle started with the Flemings, led here by the White Hoods of Ghent, marching straight into the French. This caused some confusion in the French center, but it did not spell disaster. This offensive push was Philip von Artevelde's big mistake. In marching on the French, he gave up his defensive position, and he did not properly protect his flanks. That compounded with the French knight's superior mobility to create a disaster for the Flemings. Shortly after the Flemish forces made contact with the French, the constable of France, Olivier de Clisson, saw his opportunity. 
He ordered the heavy cavalry of the French wings to encircle the Flemings, and that one maneuver decided the battle. All of a sudden, the Flemish forces were outflanked, surrounded, and squeezed. Panic began to tear through their lines, and their forces either fled, were killed, or were suffocated in the crowd, buckling under the pressure from the tightening noose of the French forces. The casualties were not the slightest bit even. The battle saw about a hundred Frenchmen killed, but over 25,000 Flemings. Philip von Artevelde met his end at Ruisbeek, and so did the fortunes of Ghent. The French forces made a sweep through Flanders, brutally reimposing comital power and taking some revenge for having to slog through the swamps of the Low Countries in late autumn. Louis of Mala was vocally opposing the destruction caused by the French knights, but at this point his word counted for little to the king and his ministers. Philip the Bold may not have liked to see his future lands put to the sword and flame, but he knew that there was no point in trying to rein in the fury of the French knights. Courtrai, being so near to the battlefield, was the first place to feel the wrath of French chivalry. After the Battle of the Golden Spurs, the spurs that the Flemings collected ended up being stored in the Church of Our Lady in Courtrai. The aftermath of Rosbeck saw the spurs reclaimed. Courtrai was then plundered and burned to the ground, despite the pleading of Louis. Louis was at least able to save Bruges from the same fate by arranging for the city to pay a massive indemnity to the French forces. However, the revenge taken on Courtrai may have delayed the French army and given Ghent a chance to fight on another day. All of Flanders was pacified, save for Ghent. The city maintained its rebellion under a new leader, Francis Ackerman, a chief lieutenant of Philip von Artevelde. But the pacification was not a boon to Louis's fortunes. The terms imposed on the cities of Flanders by the King of France were harsh. Most importantly, Flanders lost its exemption from the French trade embargo of English goods, which had been arranged at Bruges by Philip the Bold a few years earlier. The French now had other issues and crises popping up in the wake of Rosbeke, and after a quick and brutal sweep through much of Flanders, vacated the county. And so Louis would be left to deal with the rebellious Gentinars, but he would not have to fear for his position again. One of the crises that popped up was another urban revolt in Paris. Luckily for the king and his uncles, the aftermath of Rusbeke saw them marching triumphantly throughout northern France after putting down a huge urban revolt, so the people of Paris seemed comparatively easy to deal with. In the end, a show of force was all that was needed, the ringleaders of the revolt were executed, and more taxes were reimposed now that the royal position was stronger. But once more, back to Flanders. Louis went about re-establishing his control over the county and taking revenge on Ghent. In all the cities that capitulated to him, the leading rebels were rounded up and executed. While the Count couldn't directly target the citizens of Ghent for retribution at the moment, he was able to seize territory outside the city owned by the citizens. If 1382 saw French intervention into Flanders, 1383 saw England pick up the thread. The imposition of the French boycott on English goods onto Flanders put significant pressure on the English treasury, as now Bruges was closed to English wool and other goods. Additionally, the Bishop of Norwich, Henry de Spencer, was calling for a crusade. It might be a little ironic that Louis of Mala, now the primary antagonist of the urbanist crusade, was an urbanist himself, but de Spencer was still able to rally support. He had been empowered by the Roman Pope Urban VI to crusade against supporters of the Avignon Papacy in England, and under certain conditions in France, but this expedition wasn't a fully sanctioned crusade. Still though, de Spencer was able to raise funds from his flock and was able to secure a tidy sum from Parliament. In mid-1383, the expedition landed in Calais and moved east through the county, taking a handful of small castles and towns as they went. The quote-unquote Crusaders, met up with a force from Ghent by Ypres and began to besiege the vehemently urbanist city, hinting that Ghent's politics, rather than Dispenser's religious motives, were deciding strategy. Ypres had no intention of capitulating to Ghent and the English this time. They had supported Ghent's revolts in the past, and in the very recent past, and it had never seemed to end well for the Ypres. Also, the past few years had really eroded the support that non-Gentinars had for Ghent, so this time, Ypres decided to hold out. Dispenser called on Ypres to surrender, to which the Ypres refused, responding that they were urbanists. 
Dispenser then excommunicated the town. The English and Gentinar forces assaulted the walls of Ypres a few times, but in the end only had losses of their own to show for it. And while Ypres was under siege, the forces of Charles VI were preparing to march back to Flanders. The English realized that they would be unable to take Ypres, and so marched back towards Calais. They were cut off by the French forces on their retreat, and while Dispenser wanted to fight, his men flat out refused. In the end, they took shelter in Gravelines, which they had taken early in the campaign. Eventually, an agreement was reached in which Dispenser would surrender Gravelines and be free to leave. This crusade's failure marked the end of Dispenser's career, but more importantly for us, it marked the end of any assistance that might be rendered to Ghent from the English. From now on, the Gentinars were on their own. That being said, they were still holding out. While Dispenser was causing trouble for the Count and the French, Francis Ackerman had managed to take Odenarda, something that Philip von Artevelde had not managed before Rusbeke. A few months after the English left Flanders, Louis of Mala died. He had ruled Flanders fairly successfully for almost 40 years, and if not for the state of the county in his last years, his time as count would probably be seen in a much better light. But I would like to do my best to vindicate him. Louis inherited an incredibly complex balancing act and managed to hold things together where a lesser count would have seen it all fall apart. Throughout his setbacks and conflicts, he was able to steadily increase the power of the commodal office and much of what Philip the Bold and the rest of the Valois Counts of Flanders will build in the Low Countries comes from the base that Louis of Mala prepared. At the very least, he was probably the best of the Dampierre Counts of Flanders. Finally, while his house would end with him, his family would go on to do incredible things in the Low Countries, and he does deserve a lot of credit for the rise of Valois Burgundy. The marriage of Philip the Bold and Margaret of Flanders did not serve to end Flemish autonomy as Louis may have feared. Rather, it was the first step in creating a new political entity with Flanders at its center. Back in episode 1, I mentioned the Burgundian king Gundahar's attempt to conquer Gallia Belgica. Gundahar's expedition ended in disaster, but he would have the last laugh in a way. Philip the Bold was descended from Charles of Valois, who was descended from Hugh Capet, who, through his grandmother, was a descendant of Charlemagne, who himself was a descendant of the Merovingians. As the early Merovingians had a habit of marrying Burgundian princesses, it is not unreasonable to draw a line from Philip the Bold back to Gundahar. And so, many generations later, the Burgundians finally gained control of Gallia Belgica, or at least parts of it. Next episode, we will finally see Philip the Bold step into his new role as Count of Flanders. Ghent still needs to be pacified, and relations with England need to be eased so that wool can flow once more. But now, it's a whole new ballgame. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, I would really appreciate it if you would rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your platform of choice and tell your friends about it. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me on twitter.com slash Burgundy or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website at granddukesofthewest.com.